I'd like to, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. Yes? Uh, are we going to be on YouTube? No, maybe. Maybe. Just be sure to smile at the camera if the camera gets close. Uh, I'd like to introduce ourselves. This is uh, Ken Erickson. He's uh, the secretary of our club as well as the newsletter editor. And why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself, Ken? I'm the Academy of Model Air and Aeronautics <laughs> uh, introductory flyer pilot for there are several of us in this club. I'm also a contest director for the Academy of Model Aeronautics. I've been a member of the Academy of Model Aeronautics since the late 50s. Been there over 60 years as a member. And my first radio control that worked was in 1966. So Ken, Ken has got, you can see he's got a lot of experience. And Mike Martha, Martha over here, he's our field manager. Takes care of, uh, in charge of all the mowing and the fixing of stuff, and building of things. And Mike? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm uh, the equivalent of Ken. I'm one of the trainers for the club. So if, if you guys ever came out, uh, we, Ken or I at this point would be the one that would train you. We do have a third person. Uh, I've been in the hobby since about 73. Wow. I just came out of high school <coughs> and uh, got a good enough job that I could actually buy some of this for myself. It's running, right? Uh, so I've been in it around 43 years. And it's just a blast to be in. And uh, hopefully you will spark some interest, you guys. So right there between the two of them, that's 140 years of experience. And me, I can add four and a half years. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a newbie. Uh, our club was formed about uh, 11 years ago in 2007. And uh, we currently, at the end of 2017, we had 50 plus members. Uh, we'd like to have at least two more. Uh, I'm going to tell you more about our field and the location of it uh, later and what it consists of. And our uh, meeting, we have a meeting once a month except for December and January. And that meeting is held at Morales Mexican Restaurant on 25th Street in Central. Uh, we start, we have a social hour, it starts, from, starts at six, ends at seven. And our meeting starts at seven. And I do every time, I, I am, I should have introduced my, my name is John Vincent, and I'm the club president of Montgomery County Radio Control Flyers. And I make it a point of trying to get that meeting ended at eight o'clock. We used to have some meetings that straggle on to 8.30, quarter to 9. That's, that's just too long. Uh, so I do, you can pretty well count on being out of there at 8 or shortly thereafter. And our meeting normally consists of, we have uh, reports from our, our officers, like Mike will report on the field, our treasurer will report on our, how much money we got, uh, different people, uh, different things. And then we always have a short open floor discussion. If somebody has something they want to bring up, then we uh, allow them to talk about it. Uh, but, but if it's going to start into a drag into a long situation, then I'll I, I get it slowed down and stopped because we still want to get out at 8 o'clock. And then the very last thing we always do is uh, we have a show and tell where guys will, if they discover a new way of doing something, they'll talk about it. If they want a new plane, might want to bring it in, show it off, tell about it. So that type of thing. As well as we have, occasionally we'll have somebody come in, one of maybe one of our club members, and like Jim Merriman recently did presentations on different types of old uh, World, War, World War II planes. Uh, specific zeros in on a specific type of plane and tells a little about it, the people who flew it, and things like that. So that's basically what our club is about. And uh, now, uh, what we, what, uh, we're going to actually, oh, sorry, here we go. I'm still on. Uh, you might have a question. I've never flown an RC plane before. How can I learn to fly one? We have experienced people in our club that will buddy box you, and you're probably asking now, what's a buddy box? Well, Mike and Ken are going to explain to you how it actually works. I only have one, Mike. That's all right. And you'll have, to, you'll have to pretend that 
Mike is the instructor, Tian is the student. And Mike, you have, you have to you have to imagine that Mike is taking like this plane right over here. And he's taxiing it up the grass runway and takes it off and gets it up 300 feet in the air, 200 feet in the air, and start and is flying it around. And then Okay. Um, and what I'm going to do is basically, if you guys were to come out to the field, this is exactly what I would do with you. So uh, the first thing I would tell you before we even get started is that if the plane we're training on were to crash, it's not your fault. It's my fault or Ken's fault because we have ultimate control of the uh, aircraft. Okay. So when you get started, you have one way to do it uh, between two pilots, the teacher and the student, is what's called a buddy box cord, and it actually would fit right in there. And then what happens is I now have the potential to control his plane by this little switch right here on the corner. And if I pull that forward, it's spring loaded, but if I pull that forward, it will actually allow me to take over the controls. So you can have it upside down and sideways, and all I have to do is let go of that switch and fly the plane. Um, um, one of the things that uh, we're gonna do is just talk a little bit or go through, again, exactly what we would do. So if we're standing at the field, the first thing I'm gonna tell Ken is I'm gonna take it off, and I'm gonna get it up to an altitude we call three mistakes high, so that's few hundred feet in the air, so if something bad happens, you don't have to worry about it. We just take it, and Ken's really excited, you just like the people we normally train. So what I'm gonna do is get it up in the air. So I'm gonna hold this switch, and I'm gonna fly it up in the air, take it off. So we'll give it some throttle, pull it up, watch it go up in the air, and then I'm gonna go, Ken, your airplane, and then I'm gonna let go of that switch. And now Ken can fly, and as you see, he's a oh, oh, he's a oh, guy. Oh. So I take over, and I I control it. And I say, Ken, much less movement, and don't move it very often. So be very gentle with it. You don't have to crank it bank to bank. That just very slight movements, and it'll go. Okay. So what I'm going to do is we'll fly around a little bit more. I'll get it in an attitude that he understands. It's flat, flat and level. Let's say. And then I'll turn to him and say, Ken, you're an airplane, and I'll let go. And look how he's flying now. He's being very careful. He's still going to make mistakes. But let me tell you a little secret. You guys won't make nearly the mistakes that we did. Because we were, we're the older you get, oh, I've got it. Oh, oh, I'll take it. The older you get, the better you will be much more quickly. Uh, it's... Uh, it's amazing to me. Guys like you can step up and fly a plane almost immediately. You, you're comfortable with it because you've been around things that have hand-eye coordination requirements, whereas we mostly played with rocks and sticks. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay, so I, as we go around, and I, I'll tell Ken, you know, ease up on the, do you have, I have. So I'm gonna tell him, all right, your airplane, He's gonna take over, and I'm gonna just stand here and tell him, move the sticks gently, just try and, you know, don't watch me, watch the airplane at all times. And he's doing that. Now, we have people that look other ways, and that's very bad, in which case I would take over. But then we would just bring it, once Ken's done, and usually, Runs the older you are, the more, more nervous you become, so we'll land pretty quickly, give him, 10 minutes of flight time. And our job, both Ken and I, who fly all the time with people, we just want to keep the plane up in the air. Because the plane teaches you how to fly. If it does something wrong, you try something different. All we want to do is keep that plane in the air. So we'll, we'll come back and we'll land it. And I will congratulate Ken for a nice flight. And then we'll fuel up and prop it fuel up or change batteries, depending on what kind of plane. And then we'll go back up in the air. Uh, we do have uh, days in the club where we actually invite people in from where, anywhere in Columbus or outside, whatever. And we have an open house and we 
try and teach people how to fly, or at least put them on a, a buddy box and let them fly. And that, we just want, come on in. Our set up too, we just want to Oh, okay, bring your stuff in. So that, I think, concludes this piece of it. What did I miss, Ken, anything? Oh, there is another, there is another way to do this without this cumbersome. Technology board. has advanced. Yes. And what, what we can do is plug a little receiver into the student's radio. It's, it just plugs on the outside, and then we can control it with just radio waves instead of that cord. Yes? Which one would you usually use? I don't really use have. that, but <laughs> I actually have one of the, uh, the cordless. The only problem with using a cord is that you're both flying, you want to hold the, uh, the extra cord up because... You don't want to step on it. <laughs> yeah, I did this once. I stepped on the cord while teaching my great nephew to fly and pulled it down on my radio. That's okay, because I still have control. <coughs> Excuse me. Unfortunately, I forgot that. And so I'm telling him, pull up, pull up, but he's, he has no control. And I, I held the button and watched it go right through the trees. <laughs> So that was a, and we've all done things like that. It, you just <clears throat> forget where you're at. Uh, but it's pretty rare, uh, and we try not to do that. So a lot of you ask, what do you prefer? And I've been, I've been buddy boxed by both of these guys. And Mike always uses the cable, and Ken is always without one. So, but you get anything. And there's, we actually have three guys that do training. These two guys are the main ones, though. They're out there every. Oh, the, we have. Are we flying your plane, or are we flying the, the plane we, we bring now? We like to fly our planes. And well, you're going to keep the kids on your plane. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're going to do that so that number one, if it crashes, they're not totally destroyed because their plane's in the dirt. Yeah. No. But we're normally, going. it's just we're familiar with our planes, and at the point we think they're ready to fly their plane. Someone in the club will work with them to make sure everything's set up, the radio's working properly. It's, it's a lot to do with safety. And then we may, even if they would like us to, put them on a buddy box on their plane and let take it up and let them get a little used to it because it might fly different than a train. And then when they're ready and they've soloed, we'll just take that plug out and let them fly the plane, usually standing next to them so if they a little confused, but there is still a possibility of handing the radio off. That, that's what, uh, well, he's a Kent Bowser, right? We yes. flew up there. We didn't fly any this year, but last year he flew, and that's what they did. They took the plane up in the air for him, yes. and got it up there, and didn't give it to him for two or three, great. Two great. three seconds. And, but he did get so he could land and take it off. Yeah. Oh, well, that's great. He Good fingers. Yeah, that's the way, way to go. But this year ain't, ain't flew nothing yet. So. But it's, and, and I really am serious that these two guys. Yeah, you, you play fast. computer games, I assume, right? Yeah. Well, any bit, any bit that you do like that is, like you say, eye coordination is perfect. Good language helps. Okay, uh, so Mike is going to Mike's going to talk a little bit now about the different types of planes. What did we do? Well, we lost our glider. Uh, the first plane that you think of when you get into Planes, and I bet you guys have even had these. They're little gliders that are made out of also that somebody oh, there's for you. Ah. You can also get foam gliders with six foot wingspan, but we decided not to bring that. So, what a glider, I'm talking about propulsion. I can get as high as you can. What do you think makes the glider go? Yes. Hmm? The wings. The wings hold it up. And the drag and uh, oh, yeah, technical. Yes. Uh, down force or well, one of the things is your arm, right? That is the initial propulsion, and what makes it go connected to the wings is gravity pulling it toward the earth. So what it's going to do is glide as it goes toward the ground. And it's got to be level or down, pointed down. If it's if it's too heavy in the back, then it just yeah, you, there are things we, we have to do to trim them out. So we have a glider, and most of us, at least I did, started with just throwing those things. Next, once level up, is you put some sort of actual propulsion on the plane, like this one, which is a rubber band powered plane, and 
all the and those are as you can tell, it, they're a lot of fun. Uh, you, and these kind of planes, you have to be careful when you fly them, usually when the air is still. <coughs> but very, very simple. Oh, and I'll give this back to Kim because I think it's now it flipped its wing. Uh, the next one is when you have a piston engine and go over here. Oh, there's oh, thank two you. of them, right? Yeah, two of them. So a piston engine is uh, like this, and it doesn't burn gasoline. It burns glow fuel, and glow fuel is basically an oil with nitromethane in it. So with these planes and their props, they you basically fuel it up, start it by flipping it and putting a little uh, connection on top of it in order to get it going and then you go off and fly. So you have fuel in this one that you need to replenish, yeah. Sir, do you, does it have control by control? It, yes, it's controlled by a radio. So if, if we were to turn that, oh, okay. if we were to turn it on, if we turn this on and turn that on, you would see, and John's gonna go through that. You, can, uh, you can flip the switch for us. If you watch that one, and I move these sticks, Things will move, and I, we won't go into that right now, but it, same thing with any of these planes that are remote control. So above a glider, you just control them with this thing. Now, the next one is an electric version of that, so, and that's really popular now. And if you look at this one, there's just a very small electric motor on the front of it that turns that one off and gives you plenty of thrust to fly the plane. The difference being, you don't have any messy fuel, you don't have to wipe your plane down after you're done. And a lot of people, we have guys in our club that don't fly any of the, the glow engines because they do make a little bit of a mess, but that's part of flying with glow engines. You clean it off and everything's just fine. This one, uh, when you go to the field, you just have your, usually your transmitter, your plane, maybe a few little tools, but you don't need to carry fuel and a starter and a battery. You just flip the switch. So it's, that's really nice. Uh, let's see, the motor glider is kind of the, taking the first one we talked about, a glider and putting a motor on it, right? And up here is a plane called the Bixler, and it just so happens to have the motor in the back. Some of the gliders have it in the front. This is neat because if it were to hit somebody, you don't have a prop. And, and normally, trust us, we very safe, that doesn't happen. But uh, this is a, what we call a motor glider. It's electric. Uh, you can actually get planes that are, have a glow engine that do the same thing. But most people, I think, today go to this. They're fairly inexpensive and it's, it's a fun plane. So it's a glider that's inherently more stable and easy to fly. Yes? I have something I guess you'd call a glider, but it has this little charge, and it has this little piece, and you put it in the water, and you charge it for 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's an that, on board battery. Yeah, so you've got a battery on board, and your little charger here is actually charging that little on board battery. And it doesn't take long because the battery doesn't have a lot of capacity. But yeah, you can do that with these. You generally take the battery out of them because they make it very easy to do that. And you'll notice that people have in their cars either off the battery or they bring a separate battery and they hook them together and charge it up through a charger. So it, you can do it lots of different ways. And as you get more into this, if you do, uh, we'll, we'll help you with all the, there's so many choices, it's like anything. Uh, just a lot of choices, and you can spend as little or as much as you want. Okay, the next one is a little bit more sophisticated, and it's called a ducted fan. So if you can imagine the fan in your house, when you get hot, you turn it on, and it's little round blades, and it blows. This is exactly the same thing, except the fan that's inside there turns at 20,000 RPM. So if you did that on a fan at home, it would blow you out of the room. 
This one actually propels the plane, and it's the thing with these is as you're flying them, you have to remember that the ducted fan doesn't react as quickly because you're using a some air to blow it forward, right? But they're a lot of fun, and the, the best thing about those, can you tell me what is from a safety perspective, either one of them? Um, Ooh. Hang on. That's inside. That's right. The fan is inside. So you can't, I mean, you could put that on a pillow and sleep on it. There's no fan to hurt you. But yeah. these others, if they're running, you have to be extremely careful, even the electrics, because they can do damage. Okay, the last one is truly called a turbine. And it's for people that are willing to spend a large amount of money. And they are basically exactly like the jet aircraft that you see in the military, uh, flying people around. Uh, they're, it, it's just a high-speed turbine that pushes air, compresses it, and pushes it, and makes the plane go. They're really, really expensive. Uh, and most people that I know don't fly them, but we there are we have a guy in our club that built one because he's a machinist. Uh, but they're really expensive. I wouldn't expect you to be involved with that uh, until later in life. If yeah, at least a couple, weeks, a couple of weeks into it or so. Okay, I think when he says expensive, he means like five, six, seven thousand dollars and up. More than a two-cylinder bang bang tractor. Yes, <laughs> probably. Okay. Next. I'm next. No, no, never mind. Ken's going to tell you what you can do. Ken's going to tell you what you can do. Yeah, I'll tell you what you can do. Yep. Okay. Well, my job right here is what can you do with these airplanes? And what you can do with what happens here? Oh. What you can do with these airplanes. There it is. What you can do with these airplanes is you can learn to keep the airplane in the sky. That's the first thing you learn. And you learn that during the buddy boxing or during the winter, we fly airplanes like that and bigger in St. Peter's Lutheran Church Gymnasium. And as you can see, it's possible to fly the thing in here. They say it takes a 15 by 15 room. That has a battery. It has a radio receiver. It's got things that move. That's it. Fear not. I have been hit with them at full yeah, speed. Not a, hurt. not a problem. Yeah, the yeah. other. Uh, now that the yellow one, one on the other hand. For is outdoors. That's the reason I bought this Vixler. An airplane that has wings much longer than the fuselage is a, usually a stable airplane. And almost anybody can get started with a motor glider. Or a glider if you had a way to get it up in the air. So that's, that's some things for getting started. The second thing you have to do is to learn how to land rather than crash. Yes. Okay. Then you're able to bore holes in the sky. So after you get so you can bore holes in the sky, you can go and participate in fly-ins. Fly-ins are where people gather, fly their airplanes, look at other people's airplanes, and Still talk to okay. the other people. Yeah. We spend 80% of our time talking to the other people at the field. You might not want to do that. Then there are fun flies. Fun flies are like fly-ins, except you have a little tasks. It's fun to do tasks, you know. So then, after the fly-ins, we do have things you can do, and they're in the Academy of Aeronautics Events rule book, because those are more tasking. There is fixed wing scale. Scale means you built it to look just like a full-scale airplane, like the ones out at the airport. Fixed wing scale has five different events with seven classes. There's RC aerobatics, where you go, mm, mm, 
but you got to do exactly what you're supposed to do when you do them in sequence. A lot of our guys do RC aerobatics, but they just do it while they're boring holes in the sky. So anyway, RC aerobatics has two events with eight classes, and these classes are age-based. So if you were ever to get into competitions like that, you'd be flying against people your own age. And people your age, there's a kid seven years old who competes in that event. So anyway, then there's RC scale aerobatics, where it's the same thing, but it has to have a really good looking airplane. RC combat, that's where you put, today that is like eight, 10, 12 airplanes in the sky at one time with streamers behind them. Now we can't do that in our field because we don't have eight, 10, 12 guys who would do that. We might have four. But you have a great paper stream of streamer behind the airplane, and you try to cut the other guy's streamer. And they get into what's called a furball, like that. That's a lot of fun, very exciting. Then we have, after combat, we have RC helicopter. There are helicopters that are really efficient, not really great looking helicopters. And there's three skill levels of that, plus agents. RC scale helicopter is where the helicopter has to look like a real full scale big helicopter that carries people. That takes a lot more work making them, but there's people who just love to do that. There's RC soaring, which is gliders. There are seven different events in RC soaring gliders and age differences. And then there's RC pylon racing. In pylon racing, there are six nationally recognized classes of which, and they go from 60 to 200 miles an hour. Here, we do Club 40. It's got two classes. One is 60 miles an hour, one's 100 miles an hour. And this airplane right here is the same ARF, the same airplane that some of our guys use for racing. Some of the rest of us use a little less expensive airplane, but it has the same wing and the same tail, just not that fancy fuselage or that fancy landing, landing gear. And one class goes 60, one class goes 100. There is RC assisted free flight, which is kind of a funky thing. Then there's fun fly, which we talked about. And then there's, uh, Quads and hexcopters. You may have seen quads flying on television in that racing one. No, you have where they take an old warehouse and they make pump funnels and they make them fly through the doors. They start out with 300 quads and eight to 12 guys flying them. And every single race, there's about two or three quads just get totally demolished running into stuff. Um, Quads and hexcopters are really helpful. Did you see on television how they dropped that life raft to the two guys that were caught in the surf? Quad dropped that life raft. People delivering pizzas by quad, you know, that isn't that exciting, but there are a lot of great things that people who know what they're doing and play by the rules can do with quads. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people that mess with quads and don't play by the rules, and that's got the government on our backs for a while. Oh, you want to do that? Okay. The airplanes are typically made of balsa or light fly. Light fly is balsa inside of thin plywood, making a new light plywood. Or they can be made out of improved styrofoam. That's balsa light fly. These are, that's, these are styrofoam, balsa light fly, balsa plywood, styrofoam, and styrofoam. And that's my part. Next guy. Uh, you mentioned quads. Uh, that's a larger quad that I've got, and that was, uh, that was $125. Uh, it came with an FPV. Uh, screen on it as well as a camera and uh, your your display your transmitter when it was up in the air I could see out in front of it what was actually going on now since the 
since I first got the FPV screen failed, and so I've taken the camera off of it and I just go out and fly. Uh, but it's, good, it's a good fly. And then, down to a smaller deal, this is called a quadcopter car, and I think it was about 33 bucks. And the reason it's called a quad quadcopter car $62.73, and then I had to spend, to get the motor ESC and other essentials, another $85. So you're talking about $150. Plus, I, but I had a lot of fun building. Includes the covering? Include the covering. Yeah. Yeah. I had to buy covering. I had to buy the big roll of uh, the, the covering to, to get that job done. Uh, that's all okay. And uh, so I've got about the Mike's going to talk about his... Uh, Pixel a little bit, price, cost of? Yeah, the, uh, this is actually Ken's plane, I believe, yes. Mm -hmm. The Bixler, and remember we said it was a powered glider. Uh, so this plane, all told with the plane, the battery, receiver, uh, it's about 140 ish dollars. Uh, that may or may not seem like a lot of money, but it's a very forgiving plane and easily flown when you're uh, just new at the, the hobby. So about 140 You throw that plane, right? Hmm? Yeah. Oh, well. You can. You hold it and let it go. You don't really 
No, you give it a little toss. Little. Right. I give. I give mine a little toss. Very not much. It'll yeah. take off on its own. Um, but that's you know that's kind of the range, about one hundred and forty dollars. Tossing them takes some skill. Well, that's you that's the problem with tossing. Yeah, you know, if, you, if you're not careful, you can toss it down. Are you going to make sure. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. That's right, go ahead. Uh, how high will that layer go? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, we legally, can you see? How let me, can you see? Let me say this. Legally, we're supposed to stay in below 400 feet. Yeah. And that's because there may be air traffic, especially with Columbus Airport, coming in. Uh, rarely do they come over our field, but we're supposed to be at about 400 feet. The planes will usually go until you can't see them. And they'll be so small, they'll look like a little speck, and then you, you don't know how to control them. So what most people do is just take their fingers off the stick and see what it's gonna do. And, you know, it's, we recommend that you keep it within eyesight. And for some of us, that's a lot shorter distance than for you guys. So that's another thing that's interesting. When we're flying with you or training, you can see the plane much better and you, we maybe cannot. So we try and keep it in close, but yeah, you can fly until you can't see. And if there's a, even a gentle breeze, mm -hmm. so you wanna fly up and down for yourself. Because if the plane is dancing, and you lose orientation or something, then it's coming back to you as opposed to being away yeah. and going away from you. You fly into the wind, right? Yeah, well, yeah. But but mainly, you fly, you fly your patterns upwind a little bit. Yeah. But you don't want to fly down. I found that out the hard way more than once. This is the next airplane. This is uh, one put out by a company that uh, puts out a lot of airplanes. Um, they're not the one that has the most little airplanes, but this comes with this airplane, comes with this battery for that airplane, comes with batteries for the transmitter, and comes with this very simple transmitter. But this very simple transmitter is capable of buddy boxing these airplanes. Now, I tried to fly this in St. Peter's Lutheran Church Gymnasium, but as it was the first time I tried to fly it, and it's considerably heavier than the vapor, I decided I would wait till summer and fly it outside where you can take off, get up high, and then feel what the airplane does. Everything we do is the same as what the people that fly the Cessnas and the Pipers and those airplanes where you sit in them. We just do it a lot smaller and less danger to us. You can, you can mess up your fingers with the propeller, but that's about as bad as it gets. So that's the, uh, yeah. This transmitter will control that airplane if I feel like it. And how much is that airplane? Oh yes, that one is $66. Just everything you saw in the box. The, the charger for the receiver battery is right there. So 66, but this isn't a first airplane. This isn't a first airplane. A first airplane would be, well, the first airplane is gonna be one that we put you on with the buddy box. I've had young people, 12, 13, 14, that the second flight, I let them fly by themselves. I gave them the transmitter and let them fly. Uh, it just sees how quickly you can learn to do it. I'm gonna leave this out, because like John says, we're gonna let you come up here and look at everything. That's the end of the Voyager. Yeah. The next one is this. This is a, uh, a not, this is not a kit plane. This is a, that's I don't a have to punch it out came with parts that I just put together. That's an ARF. An ARF. An ARF, by the, by the way, ARF stands for almost ready to fly, if you didn't know. And there's RTR, ready to fly, so on and so forth. 
Uh, this is what, these are the parts that this plane came to me in. You can't see a lot of the stuff because it's low fi carbon fiber uh, braces. And then all the, uh, the wings, a lot of the surfaces have these little carbon, carbon fiber strips about that wide. And they come in many different lengths. Uh, and they talk to you in millimeters. <laughs> you know, it's kind of difficult. So I had to, uh, I put all my stuff down and had a ruler there. And I said, I, I had one of these things, Alexis. You know, those yeah. And I said, Alexis, tell me how, in inches, how long 94 millimeters is. And she'd tell me inches, then I'd say, oh, okay, that's that one. And that's why I put it in. And it's just a rubber cement and you just put it in. But it has that, that type of uh, bracing all over. You can see here, there, back on the tail, back there. And that's what makes it pretty stiff. Uh, it is a, what they call a 3D plane, because if this plane will hover like this and do maneuvers, yes? Um, where do you get those? Where what? Well, this one came from Hobby King. Uh, I don't know. Hobby King has a lot of stuff is shipped out of China, uh, a global warehouse, but they also now have an East Coast and a West Coast warehouse, so you get things a lot quicker than what we used to. Now, a 3D is this is this, you have a high on your a receiver, you have low rates and high rates, but you probably fly this on high rates. So this, look at the movement, look how the surfaces, how much they move. And that's so that you can hover like this. Uh, at our events, every once in a while, the guy with the name of Ben Batch shows up, and you really have to see him fly. It's amazing. And he doesn't do it with one of these planes. He does it with something like that, only about twice as big. Uh, and very expensive plane, too, by the way. Uh, I don't have a prop on this. Oh, by the way. Uh, I had the prop on in case I, you know, in case I uh, hit the prop by accident and went go flying out. There's flying another out. guy so named Chuck that's Baker. The, that's the Valor, and again, that was, uh, that, 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 that plane cost me $35.25. Oh. But I had, I had the motor, I had a receiver. What else do I have in that? Motor, receiver, and battery. I had those things hanging on my shelf. That's, that motor came out of another plane that I crashed and just, whenever you crash your plane, you can take all the electronics out hanging on your pegboard for use at a later point. And in this case, if I'd had to buy additional stuff, it would have been another $70 probably. But I just had it hanging around and used it. So that's the, uh, that's the Valdor. Uh, where's my paper at? Oh, here it is. I'm next. Okay, have at it. Okay. Uh, as you get along in the hobby, and you may want to go to something that's a little more scale-like, and that would be like this one. It's called the GB, G E E B E E G B Z, and it was developed by some brothers, and they they did some uh, several iterations. This one is one of the last ones, and it was purely a 1930s racing plane. So it's made to go really fast. That's uh, gas. Yeah, that they can. This one, Once you lift, lift it up. I'm going to put uh, a gas engine in it, a 20cc gas probably. But you can use glow uh, as well. Uh, you can put a 1.2 or 1.50 uh, cubic inch engine in it. It's a beautiful. Uh, it it actually is. Uh, as I said, it, it came as an art, correct, Ken? Yep. And I say, I asked Ken because it was Ken's plane initially and I bought it from Ken. And this is something to throw out at you guys. Uh, the cost of that plane, if you told it all up and you were buying all new stuff, it's about $850. But would you spend that? No, not necessarily. What, what you do is, you buy other planes, you fly, you've got some servos. You have a radio, you're flying some of these, you have a radio. Then maybe you've got a couple, three planes, so you have some receivers. And you, you save a lot of money on this by doing that. Uh, if I had paid $850 for that, my wife would have killed me. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. So 
But what happens is guys like Ken, who flew this initially, he makes improvements to it, and then he gets tired of it and says, hey, somebody want to buy this? And I bought it from him. And knowing that Ken worked on it, I knew it was in great shape. So that's, like I said, much, much less than $850. Have you flew that? I have not yet. Ken has several times. <laughs> and it flies beautifully. It takes off beautifully. Landing was really tough because of the close closeness of the two gear. And I've got some planes to do the same thing. But this one is probably more exaggerated. When you land, it has to be going exactly straight. If not, it'll lean, it'll tip. And if you're really in sorry shape, it'll go sideways and do, then do a bad tumble. Yeah. Yes? I have just one question. Sure. What is under that sheet? We're going to get to that in a little bit. <laughs> what is what? What's under that sheet? Yeah, right. It's not a dog. <laughs> okay, so that was nice Mike buddy. with his and you're the story uh, of the GBZ that he bought. I hadn't gotten tired of it. I got frustrated with it. <laughs> and then my doctor said, uh, you got to go see the head surgeon a month, uh, three weeks from now. And luckily, there was a swap meet. A swap meet is where people bring their stuff in and they sell it. And it's usually quite a bit cheaper than if you bought it. And I sold a potload of stuff at that swap meet. It's called your, your preparation for death, cleaning. <laughs> you clean your house, not knowing what you're doing, what's going to happen to you. This next one is my latest airplane. Oh, I'm going to say something about that. Carol and I moved quite a bit when we were working. And it was sad that when we finally located some place, I would get a big, pretty airplane. Now, do you think that's a big, pretty airplane? Yeah. yeah. Bought that about two years after we moved here to Columbus eight years ago. Okay. This is my latest one. And uh, I should have done this while Mike was talking, but I was so interested in, in what he was saying about my... Uh, uh, well, thank you, but I'm going to do this. Oops. You always turn the transmitter on first. And then the receiver. This airplane's made out of styrofoam. It's an R. Each wing half was one piece. Each of these was one piece. That was one piece. This was three pieces. And then everything, all the Check servos, your, uh, servo motors were already in there. The all of the, uh, all of the, uh, the only thing that wasn't in there when like I bought this so. was the battery right. and the receiver. You didn't have the fingers Receivers are about oh, 25 bucks. Take, take a several oh. different <laughs> brands, and the full. receiver has to match the take transmitter. A, take a bunch of pictures. The, uh, take a bunch of pictures. Here we go. The uh, airplane cost 100 uh, the airplane. Oh, I'm supposed to talk about uh, the transmitter, not the airplane. Okay, we can do it both. Well, we'll leave that plugged in. No, that will put us out of sequence. This is my transmitter. I have two of them. You know why? Buddy boxing. Oh, yeah. This transmitter costs $139, except the people we buy it from give us a $15 discount if we buy it. So I got this for $124. This transmitter has all kinds of bells and whistles. All of these switches are programmable. You can say, I want to use this switch to control that. I want to use this switch to control that. So that's what you got there. Uh, Mike, hold it up again. Yes. All right. So that's, that's this transmitter I'm talking about. The interesting thing about this transmitter and that airplane, this is the first airplane I have ever owned that had working retractable landing gear. And like I say, I've been in this RC stuff since 1966. So that's the transmitter, and later on we'll mention a little bit about the airplane. This is obsolete. This is a 625. They just came out with a 626. 
The 625 remembers everything about 20 airplanes. You can flip a switch, change it, and you can be all set up for another airplane. When I started, you had one airplane, and you had to do a lot to change and fly another airplane. The new one, which is the same price, has memory for 30 airplanes. It's, a, it's got six channels, so I could have had flaps besides the four flying channels and the retracts, but that's transmitters. You can also buy 28 channel transmitters that cost seven, eight hundred dollars. I'm too cheap to do that, so <laughs> I use this one where it's just fine. We've, okay. even got, we've even got one guy in the club that bought a 1400 on his belly. Hmm? You want it sitting on his belly? Or that's all right. Okay. That's all right. So that's me talking about transmitters. John, 86. Okay. We get back here without stumbling over. This is my 86 Texan. I've had it for a few years. Haven't flown it yet because I'm. Mike and Ken getting my buddy boxing skills up. So last September I did have my first uh, solo and I've flown a number of times since then. So I'm getting close to probably putting this plane in the air. Uh, like Ken's, this also has retracts. Uh, it's got a it has flaps. Ken, I wonder if you could come and hold this. You betcha. Or I'm going to show them the flaps. Oh, okay. Just take it right the flaps. The uh, the flaps are you can set them at any when you're landing. You can. They are deploying, aren't they? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you can set them set them at any any degree you want to. I guess depending upon. The winds you're coming into, or no well, wind, or it's a way to slow the aircraft down. Yeah. Oh, you do that? Awesome. No, I've then, uh, okay. Of course, it's got it has it has your ailerons and the elevator and it, naturally the rudder. And I wanted to try something just a little different. Normally, you know, your electric planes don't make any noise, right? None. They're quiet. Very quiet. Well, I put a sound system in this. I got it from Hobby King, about 35 bucks. No, it didn't cost a lot. And here you go. And I made that prop out of pop carts that came in a couple of layers of pop cart. And, uh, and I uh, then covered it over with packing tape and then cut it out to the razor. Same as the real prop, which I left at home. We take that airplane to every 